Hi everyone, this is your mini lecture on Marxism for English 101 with Dr. Harris. So I'd like to take us into Marxism by recapping a little bit about Freud and fetishism because we probably talked about it a lot in terms of the phallic symbol and talking about elephant tusks and ivory and that representation. That leads us really naturally into the idea of economy and the function of economy in power structures and systems in Heart of Darkness. So just to recap a little bit from Freud and fetishism, Freud really looks at fetishism as a substitute for the penis. And there's this idea that then that women lacked power because they lacked the penis. Now, the phallus itself is a powerful symbol, right? It's a phallic symbol. It's not the actual organ itself. It has to be an object of some kind. So we brought that up with fetishism as well, and remember that. What we're moving into here is talking about commodity fetishism. So what's a commodity? Anything that can be traded or sold and has some economic value to it. So that could be, it doesn't have to be an object. It could be something like knowledge could be knowledge of a trail, knowledge of the river, knowledge of particular strategies in order to attain any kind of ivory, right? How to manipulate cultures in order to get it or cultures manipulating each other in order to get ivory. That's a commodity. That's the thing you have to think about all day today or at least for the next eight minutes. So one of the things about text and context, it did a great job with psychoanalysis. There's a whole chapter about it. But with Marxism, there's not a whole chapter. So where you will find the most information in text and context about uh, Marxism and the terms to use starts on page 184 and goes to about page 190. It gets rolled into this idea of historical and new historicism in terms of criticism. So pay attention here because I'm going to give you a little bit more and wider scope. So the idea in Marxism is that uh, it's part of cultural materialism. There are no stable facts waiting to be discovered with any of these, according to new historicists and cultural materialists, which rolls Marxists into it. There's an indeterminate number of texts waiting on a process of interpretation with Marxism. And there are different versions of history being made simultaneously as we think about the way that history is put together. So a text can be anything that, that's used to expose the discourse at work. And the discourse means the conversation. And most of the time, the discourse is a representation of politicized conversation. It's rolled into the systems of government and things like that, right? For Marxism, we think about meaning is constructed. It's the same thing we've been doing all along, but now we're really overt because meaning is constructed in order to gain power. So Marxism is politicized. It's shaping power of economics and class structures. It stresses ideology over individuals. So it's not necessarily just about one person, but what, what system does that one person represent? It asks the question of who's being oppressed and exploited. Who's being the oppressor? And there is this inherent idea that literature is not separate from culture, but always within it. So literature is not necessarily a reflection of culture or an afterthought of it, but it's making culture at the same time it's reflecting culture, so it's wrapped up all together. So the dictionary definition with Marxism. And if you want to know what dictionary it is, just ask me in our discussion forum post. It's not dictionary.com or google.com, right? So the dictionary defines of critical theory defines Marxism as the labor theory of value. So here we're thinking about art and literature as a form of labor in constructing it. Now think Marlowe, Heart of Darkness, Buddha Marlowe, constructing a narrative is it politicized? Is there a commodity in there? Is it labor for him to construct that oral narrative, right? So literature is seen in terms of its relationship to society. Literary work reinforces or undermines the current social structure. All production of texts is based inherently on ideology and labor. So ideology labor, commodity, think about those kinds of things. And literature inherently is art. Right? 
Okay. When we're thinking of this idea of the work of art, we're also thinking about how that artwork was brought together, who was putting it together, right? We can think about the system of values applied to cartoons, the class and the economic statuses, when we also look at who is the labor force, but who is also the force that is in charge, we have to ask ourselves who possesses the most commodity, the most valuable commodity, and think about in hard darkness what that means. And is that commodity valuable or is it degenerative? Right. So the other thing that we have to think about is in terms of the ideological struggle of an individual, meaning how does that individual fit into the system and is that individual consciously struggling against the uh, system of power or unconsciously struggling against it or accepting it. So we've got a little bit of our psychoanalysis in there. We want to look at who's in the middle of that power structure and the way that you can do that, let me just do a really quick, like I've got a whiteboard here, just thought of it. When we think about systems of power, we can think about it in a really simple kind of way. We think about it in terms of, you can see that circle, right? And within that circle, the center is the power. And everybody who's out on the edges doesn't have power. Now, revolution can occur where people then gain power by ousting those in the middle of the circle. But the question always remains, the people who then gain power who were disenfranchised before, do they simply replicate the power structure in the system that was there before and oppress those who oppressed them before? And is that a better structure or does revolution create a new system of power? So think about our huge political systems all over the world. Um, we have socialism, we have democracy, we have different ways of thinking about how everybody has a voice or not intentionally on these kinds of things. Okay. Uh, one of the things about Marxism is you're always looking for a commodity. And if we look at texts and contexts, we can start to see where the different commodities come into play. And they come into play in terms of not who is passing them back and forth or the labor that's creating them, but who's the one that's actually reaping the benefits from them. And there's two places that you can start to look for this idea of a class structure. And this is just one example of it. It's not the only one. Uh, we have what's called the bourgeoisie, and that's on page 186 of Text and Context. Now that's the upper classes, and that's the, para, that's the powerful. And that comes from our big granddaddy of Marxism, Karl Marx. Right? And the opposite side to that, you might say it's even a binary, is called a proletariat. And you can find the definition of that on page 189. And a proletariat, it really simply is the working class. Now there are different levels of working class, but be very careful about the language that you use. If you want to talk about bourgeoisie and proletariat, it's not enough just to identify them. But how are they articulated? What's the class struggle? Who's being oppressed? And why are they being oppressed? We're going to get some mix-ups with psychoanalysis, but also race and ethnicity studies with Heart of Darkness. But I want you to start thinking, where's the money? And we all know what the commodity is in Heart of Darkness. The very simple one is, you know the answer to this. <laughs>